Welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name Podcast. The legend Dino is looking very, uh, is that, no, it's not Paisley, is it? What is that pattern on your shirt in Rio de Janeiro? It's a kind of tropical design in the strategic colours of blue and white. Because usually what we do on the Brazilian um, shirt name is we, yeah. we, we, we talk about a, a game in history and yeah, then we yeah. talk about the musical musical context. But I thought yeah, today yeah. We, we, we could just skip the game and go straight to the music. Is that allowed? <laughs> 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 well, don't ask me. I mean, you might be better off asking our guests. Uh, Professor Clive Shijoke Nwanka. Hello and welcome to the Brazilian Shirt Name Podcast. How much of that did I pronounce incorrectly, by the way? I know I got the Clive bit wrong, but the rest of it? Perfect. I mean, like a first time hitting now. I mean, <laughs> which not many people do, so I'm really kind of pleased you've done that, so congrats. Well, I've got an advantage, haven't I? He's, we have he's, got an he's advantage. He's playing at home. Yeah, he's playing <laughs> at home. Yeah. I am playing at home. And it's a, it's a game of two legs that we are going to be talking about today. Um, an FA Cup final. Oh, do you not miss the old days, Tim, when FA Cup finals went into replays and you had to do it all over again a few days later? Because this is one of them nights. Yeah, and I, I miss the days when the FA Cup final was a nation-stopping event. It was the big thing. It was, it was, it was great. Although I have to make a confession here: Go this on. is the the second last one before I moved abroad. And you yeah. know what? These are the first FA Cup finals that I didn't see either leg live. I was working at the time, and for me, this wasn't. Even though I was desperate for Chrissy Wad to. To, uh, to to get over the line, uh, yeah, yeah. There, there, there was something I can't remember quite what it was, but there was something stopping me getting involved in these FA Cup finals. Professor Clive, any idea what that might have been? Hmm, uh, I'm not quite sure. I mean, I'm sure there is something that springs to mind uh, momentarily. Uh, maybe the opposition. I'm not quite sure what it is, but yeah, I, I suspect that he has an affiliation to the other side of North London, <laughs> as as we know. And I grew up in mm -hmm. Tottenham, so let me just declare my interest, Professor Clive. You're on your own on this one. <laughs> yeah, but you are a gooner through and through, man and boy. Um, actually, I'm not. Believe it or not, I think it's um, a good thing to maybe like um, open or even preface our conversation with. Um, I've written a book, a course about Arsenal and about their connection to that culture and identity historically in the present day. But um, I grew up as a Liverpool fan, believe it or not. A Liverpool fan from North West London. And um, my hero at the time was John Barnes. Um, late 80s, early 90s, uh, just was an immense source of recognition and pride for me as a very, very young boy. And yeah, my the whole book really kind of comes from thinking about John Barnes and what he represented to me in the early Ooh. 90s. And then the transition in the period we're talking about to the early 90s and um, how other players, other icons kind of became more a figure for black masculinity for me at the well, time. And obviously, yeah was one of them the book is called black arsenal though um mm. and not black liverpool not black watford with regards to john barnes black arsenal why was it why was it arsenal why was arsenal the conduit team to talk about black masculine masculinity not least in football well that's just one aspect of the book so the whole idea of black arsenal is the way in which historically black communities in London and then maybe the UK and other countries as well have found a kind of sense of community and recognition and uh, I guess affinity spaces in terms of um, supporting Arsenal. That maybe you see these things on a match day, in the stands, around the ground, the old hybrid and beyond. But it's also seen in, you know, certain black cultural spaces, be it the churches or the community centers or the barbershops. And the book kind of really begins in that concept, but then spills into other things such as fashion and music and merchandise or 
gentrification and geography or thinking about television and its importance as well. But for me, thinking about cultural memory, it begins with me thinking about myself as a young person and the kind of transition that I went through, through sport and sporting culture and who I recognize as being someone of a source of recognition and what the factors were in that changing. And it's not simply about football per se. It's also about culture, politics, um, economic questions. So the game that we'll be talking about is one where I think it's quite an important transitional point from old football of the 80s into what we have now, which is the Premier League and the way in which it needs to kind of try and create these icons through commercialism and merchandise that I think allowed for the propelling of particular people, Ian Wright being one, as a kind of poster boy for the Premier League, but also a point of recognition for me as well. Well, I, I can I, I do understand the concept of the book now very clearly from how you've described it. But going back to sort of the cultural resonance, and this book is made for me because I was there, you know, this is my sort of landscape as well. Albeit I was on the other side of North London and I never understood and I still don't understand until this day, although I've got theories as to why, let's just take North London for a moment, even though your book examines a much wider landscape of a black football support, I never quite understood why there were more black fans going to see Arsenal when I started going to see football in the late 60s and throughout the 70s, essentially. I couldn't understand it because when you looked at the two areas, which are only a mile or two apart from each other, Tottenham although when I arrived in 1968 was much more of a white working class area. But over the course of the next few years from 68, it became more and more of a black area, for want of a better way of describing it, not entirely black area, but nevertheless, there was, it seemed that there was a larger concentration of black British residents in Tottenham than there was in Arsenal, which many parts of, you know, the old Highbury, all around there was much more middle class white, as I recall. But tell me, what 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 what's behind the fact that Arsenal has always had more black supporters? And that's probably worldwide than Tottenham. Yeah, I think there are a lot of factors in there. It's a fantastic question. I think historically it does go back to representation. So you're right to say that, you know, the areas of Haringey and Edmonton and Tottenham are, I guess, what we call, you know, historically quite densely black areas. I mean, I had family friends and cousins who lived in the Border Farm Estate who all supported Arsenal. I'm thinking, well, we can more or less see White Hart Lane from your bedroom window, so why Arsenal? Mm. And that was in the early 90s. So I think, of course, in the 70s, you had Brendan Batson, who played a few games uh, for Arsenal, came through the youth team before moving on and making a name at West Brom with a three degrees. But I really centered the book on Paul Davis, who was someone who spent 16 years at the club, who joined in the late 70s. And for every Paul Davis, you had hundreds of young black boys, you know, from the local area and beyond who didn't make it through the youth teams or the academies in many clubs across London, but us as one example. So I think his permanence in the Arsenal team as a first team player between 1980 and 1995 allowed for the development of that recognition that he then saw in the terraces. You know, we had amazing stories of, you know, quite important groups in the North Bank who, you know, were quite prominent in fighting against the far right from infiltrating the stands, which they maybe did in other clubs uh, in London and beyond. So I look at how his presence there then allowed for others to come through. So you had the mid 80s, and you had uh, Rocky Rowcastle and you had um, Mickey Thomas and you had Gus Caesar and you had Kevin Campbell, uh, God bless him, who all came through and saw Paul Davis as Pops as the senior kind of figure in the team. I think without that density, you would have no Ian Wright the way he became 
you would then have no Thierry Henry the way he became, mm-hmm. or even now a Saka. So I think he is someone who is really, really central to this because often what I get is a lot of what about her. So people say to me, well, what about West Ham? We had Clyde Best and other kind of players, you know, beforehand. And we had black players who played for Chelsea and beyond as well. Now, the idea is not to say that Arsenal were the first team to have a kind of density kind of um, black um, playing stuff. Of course, even Crystal Palace in Luton Town had black players in the mid to late 80s, Wimbledon in the early 90s. But how does that influence a culture or a cultural change beyond you having black players? You may play for a team, either for your youth team or players you've kind of bought. With Arsenal, you can evidence how those black presences influenced other things beyond the football. And that's the difference here. So I think that's one of the reasons I explain in the book why I think that Arsenal have historically had this swell of black support either on the match days or just, you know, around the local area of London in terms of Arsenal being referenced in everyday experiences, be it the community centres or the barber shops or the housing estates or the playgrounds and beyond as well. I remember when, when this really struck me because certainly early 70s, the association that I would make with Arsenal was more Irish mm. and they had lots of Irish in the team. Uh, and I remember going to a game, it was at Watford uh, and this is around 86 and Don Howe had just been sacked and Arsenal weren't doing very well and they lost this game actually. They got, they got beat easy 3-0. I remember the fans were chanting Donny Howe. So it was just before George Graham took over. And it was a, such a young team. And it was, the centre-backs were, were Tony Adams and, and Martin Keown, and both of whom were, were teenagers at the time. But it was also Mickey Thomas, who I think was playing fullback. Uh, and and you could see, the, he was a star of the show that night, even though Arsenal got, got beat heavily. But you could see there was real potential there. It was David Rowcastle as well as, obviously, Paul Davis. So you could see there, there was a critical mass. And mm. why was it? I mean, there, there was also Raphael Mead, who, who had a who had a, a, a blighted story, I think, Raphael, mm. Raphael Mead. But obviously, somehow, because Michael Thomas was a South Londoner, if, if, if I remember rightly, somehow yeah. the, these kids were coming through Arsenal and not other areas of London where the density of the black population might be higher. Is that just coincidence or were Arsenal open to this and actively looking for this? I mean, amazing, amazing question. And interestingly enough, like um, when I did my research, I was working at London School of Economics and I would get a taxi from Holborn to um, Highbury. And every time I got a taxi, the driver would be an Arsenal fan. And he would assume either work for the club or something else. Because I say, take me to Emirates Stadium or Harvey Stadium. And I would talk about the project and he would always ask me, is this something that Arsenal cultivated this history or has it happened by kind of chance? And I think it's by chance. I think it's something very, very kind of um, haphazard in a sense that, again, Paul Davis opened the door for others to come through and make it because Again, for every single Paul Davis, there are hundreds who didn't make it and weren't prominent. So I think that helped as well. I think transition from Don Howe, uh, even before from Terry Neal as well, and just allowing for new blood to come through that maybe other clubs are more reluctant to kind of do so, particularly big clubs in the 80s, as you know. I think the other thing is success. You know, Arsenal began to win things. I think the visibility of winning is really important. I know that Aussie Spurs had um, Chris Houghton, they won the FA Cup a couple of times in the early um, 80s and beyond. But Arsenal uh, obviously won the League Cup. You know that, in- that Chrissy Houghton did a, he, he used to write a column for the, the Workers' Revolutionary Party newspaper. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, I know that because my brother joined for a while. So we used to get this, they had this paper because it was funded by actors and so on. So they had money, the Workers' Revolutionary wow. Party. Uh, uh, and Vanessa uh, yeah, Redgrave. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So it was. And Chris Hewton used to write for him. Oh, that's, he's gone even higher notch in my estimation. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so they obviously won the, the League Cup um, in 87, um, I believe it was, and then won the league in um, 89 and 91. So I think the visibility of winning and seeing black players prominent in those moments, I think, had a transcending effect in terms of recognition. You know, I remember 89 as a young, young, young boy, 
the first game I really remember as a kid was 88 against Wimbledon, Liverpool, and seeing John Barnes thinking, well, okay, well, he's giving me them because he looks like me and you're the one black kid in your whole classroom, so he becomes your defence mechanism. You're and then I'll see 89. Uh, crying the whole weekend and dreading school on a Monday morning because he got beaten in the last minute. But, um, you know, the protagonists in that game, you know, were obviously John Barnes giving the ball away and not going to run into the kind of corner, Rocky Rowcastle's tackle, you know, and, you know, the clenched fist and, of course, Mickey Thomas's goal. So I think those iconic moments in which black players were quite prominent in them was something by chance, you know, but becomes quite impactful in the way we kind of recognise difference on the pitch. So, yeah, to answer your question, Lebo, I think um, there was something by chance about how all these things kind of came together but became quite meaningful as well. You know, it's such a great question, like you say, uh, Tim, because um, there are so many aspects of this um, that Professor Clive's just touched on. I think it's very, very crucial who you see um, because my earliest memories of the black players in football were Clyde Best and Adi Koka, who also happened to be a Nigerian on top of everything else. And for some reason, I always loved West Ham. But you know the rules of football, you have to stick to your first team. And when I arrived in North London in Tottenham in 1968, I happened to live on the side of the road where all the Tottenham fans were. On the other side of the road, they're all Arsenal uh, fans. But crucially, I remember when I started secondary school. So I, I was going to White Hart Lane, um, even though I am a Charlton supporter, but that's a long story. Remember, I arrived in North London at the age of eight. And um, when I started secondary school, I went to school closer to uh, Highbury than to Tottenham. And there's still a rivalry going on from people who go to school in, say, Hornsey, Crouch End, closer to Arsenal, and um, but come from Tottenham. Some people say that's where the post-code wars started. And certainly one of the books I've published by one of the kids who kicked off the post-code wars suggests that as well. But when I was 11 in secondary school, there was a guy, it was a mixed heritage, Osman Ahmed, half Somalian, half Welsh, and uh, he was a gooner. And do you know what I noticed about him? And we're coming on to the fashion and everything afterwards, which is a crucial part of this as well. What I noticed about Osman Ahmed, he wasn't just visiting the North Bank. He was a fundamental part of the North Bank. It seemed to me that you were more accepted as a black person. Mixed heritage for us, no difference, you were black. And not just for us, but also for those who might be against you racially. And Osman Ahmed was, I mean, he spoke like a North Banker. He, you know, wore the clothes of a North Banker. He uh, referred to the other supporters in the ways of North. It was, in fact, it was through him in a way that I ended up going to the North Bank myself just to experience this. But there's another thing I think is quite crucial. Paul Davis may have been the first. At that time, Tottenham should have been looking right under its nose. Uh, because as we've already established, there was a much more dense black population there, but not just for black footballers, for anybody. I went to school, primary school in Tottenham, just down the road from White Hart Lane. I was at school with Winston Silcott, who became notorious, obviously. I was in yeah. the same class as Winston Silcott. Used to go to his house and everything on Avenue Road, just off St Anne's Road in Tottenham. And he was the best footballer in the school by a long shot. He was on a different level from us. If it had been today, if he'd been in school today, I dare say Tottenham would already have been scouting around, sniffing. Because in those days, remember as well, we had schoolboy tournaments. You know, playing football at your junior school was a big deal. There was a primary school's FA Cup that we played at. Once I remember the final being at the park across the road from my junior school. And loads of people there, loads of people. Um, but Tottenham wasn't scouting. It was almost as if they didn't expect to find or they didn't respect 
the ability of um, new immigrants, if you like. Or oh, do, the you, do you remember that, that, that Ron Nodes quote when Ron Nodes was Crystal Palace chairman? You know, like yeah. they can't hack it in the in the cold weather. You know, <laughs> I mean, that, that, those they, prejudices they were so so deep back then, and, and maybe that that's part of it. They weren't they weren't looking because they didn't think they were going to find anything. I think, I think that's an amazing, amazing uh, point you're both making. Even thinking about that period of time, which obviously you both know more better than I do. But so I grew up in Northwest London, which was actually closer to QPR than, than Arsenal. Um, we grew up in a housing estate on the back of Wembley Stadium. Now I remember QPR had a lot of black players. Obviously, Les Ferdinand, but Andy Impey, Trevor Sinclair, Danny Maddox, Clive Wilson. Now, a lot of those were scouted from the local area. So West London, Harlesden, Park Room, and beyond. Les However, Ferdinand, right next door. In the estate right next door to uh, yeah. QPR's ground. Yeah. Amazing. So what I found was that maybe with Tottenham, just thinking about that team from the kind of late 80s, early 90s, there weren't many local boys who actually kind of came through the academy into the first team yet then kind of um, black ones. I mean, you think Darren Cascade came through in the early 90s. Obviously, Sol Campbell went to Lillishaw first, then went to kind Garth of... Um, Garth Crooks. Garth Crooks. Yeah, Garth, yeah. Garth Crooks was, was bought in from Stoke. So he's, yeah, yeah, he came exactly. Stoke. yeah. Uh, Danny Maddox was a Tottenham lad. I don't know if he was from the area, but he came through the Tottenham youth ranks and then and then went to QPR. So, mm. you know, one thing, at, at a big club, it, it is harder to make the breakthrough, isn't it? There are always going to be some who don't quite make it and then, then step down a level. Yeah, but so the, even with Sol... To mention his name, like maybe it was the case that by the time he comes to kind of prominence, there was way this kind of ingrained understanding that if you are kind of black from kind of London, the kind of gravitate towards Arsenal because there's more kind of density kind of black players there, or maybe something else. But I think you're correct that there wasn't many black players who came through the local area scene, at least then, into the first team. Obviously, now you have a wealth of different kind of players who've actually played a few games and maybe moved on, but late 80s, early 90s, I can't think of many. And the joke of it all, for me, is that, of course, Walter Tull was a black footballer for Tottenham at the beginning of the 20th century. First black officer to be killed in the First World War, British officer, um, one of the very few black uh, officers in the British Army. But he left his career, his glittering career as a football, to go and defend the country. But that history, I remember Garth Crooks telling me this, that... One day he was in the, you know, boardroom or whatever in Tottenham and um, he was like looking around at some of the photographs and then he suddenly saw this black player there and he's like, who's this? He didn't know. He never heard about it. And he was a player. He'd been playing for Tottenham for some time. In fact, I think this is even after his playing career that he noticed this. He didn't know about Walter Top. So it's almost as if Tottenham were blind to the history that they had that could attract all this talent or just completely disinterested. I tend to think it was the second place. Um, I mentioned briefly as well, Professor Clive, because your story starts when you go and you've managed to get tickets through somebody else to see Tottenham. That's right, to see Arsenal at the age of 10, I think it was. It's, It's a very similar trajectory to mine. And in those days, the crowd, maybe it's because of my age as well, because, you know, I was eight when I started that, the crowd didn't have a problem with me. It was only when I got to my teens, and I talked about Osman Ahmed being accepted as part of the North Bank, and he still is till today, because I ran into his brother. His brother went to the BBC for a while, and he said to me, yeah, season ticket holders still after all these years, you know? 50 years and more on. And when I got to the age where, you know, we started going to um, to Tottenham as teenagers, as it were, I never ever felt really part of the crowd. I never ever felt like he felt. I never thought I could bring my sort of um, soul boy clothes to Tottenham. Even though, you know, Tottenham, there's an actor, well, former actor now, I suppose, Paul McKenzie, who um, was a decent footballer. He was in this TV series called The Manageress. Do you remember that from back in the day? The Manageress, yeah, he's a little black kid with all the skills and he can play football. 
And he has always been saying, well, actually, it was Tottenham that started the casuals with people like me. I'm like, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. First time I saw Lacoste shirts that became popular in the 70s amongst football fans was at Arsenal. It wasn't at Tottenham. And then I think, Tottenham I think kind of, Liverpool got there first because of the European travel. I don't, I don't deny that. But in terms of London, certainly, it wasn't Tottenham. It wasn't Tottenham. I'll take the Liverpool thing. But let's expand on that, if I may, just to go from the casual racism or otherwise that was inherent in some aspects of football and following football at that point. And we will get back to this FA Cup final, but as you've already intimated, your book covers a wide aspect of things. The clothes, the fashion, I mean, the whole... We read a book called Skinhead by... um, He was an elderly, (laughs) believe it or not, Scottish um, alcoholic at the publishing company New English Library. And I know this because my friend's father was their managing director. But he came up with this idea to write these youth kind of like, you know, trash literature, but nevertheless, skinhead, which for us who were following football was the first sort of identity connection, right? So you wore these clothes to go to football and then you became a suede head afterwards, et cetera, et cetera. That I saw visibly the trajectory of uh, Dr. Martin's high tops uh, to Crombie's and whatnot. And suddenly you couldn't go to the football matches looking for aggro as you could with your steel toe caps, Dr. Martins. Suddenly they started dressing smart and they were dressing in the same clothes that we were going to clubs dressing as, you know, pleated trousers, um, balloon trousers, all these things at Arsenal. I never saw that. My memories of Tottenham at the same time were still flat caps and tabs. Uh, Not amongst the youngsters, but that was the predominant aspect of it. I wonder how the, perhaps from your mentioning it a moment or two ago, Professor Clive, you seem to suggest that this came hand in hand with the quote unquote black arsenal. I wonder how that was brought into the landscape, how fashion or the cultural input of black arsenal supporters resonated. I mean, Again, amazing question. Uh, before I answer very, very quickly, I'm really enjoying the nostalgia trip that you're both taking me on. <laughs> you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned the man dress. It's, it's two I old men it. sitting on a park bench. You know, it's what we do. It's what we've become. This is lovely for me because one of my earliest memories of TV as a kid was the man dress on Channel 4 on a Sunday evening, I think it was. And I remember the player talking about because I think he broke his leg in the first season. And um, there's a whole segment about him kind of breaking his leg. But then he went on to kind of... Um, been a few Guy Ritchie films as well, where I think he was playing football as well and that. So I know his own uh, career trajectory. But yeah, so um, in terms of clothing, um, it's less thinking about the casual transition, even though some of the contributions do talk about going to the games in the 80s and how clothing was quite important for them in terms of what they're wearing as a uniform, particularly going on away days uh, with Arsenal, with the herd and beyond as well. Um, but I was more focused on things like the Notting Hill Carnival, which I used to go to every single year from the age of four onwards. I know it's changed quite dramatically now since then, but it's still quite important for those reasons. And again, my earliest memories would go into the carnival and always seeing a lot of people wearing loads of Arsenal shirts. And that, even though it's in West London, making the connection between being black, being in London and Arsenal being a quite synonymous concept because the, the carnival is a kind of vibrant space of kind of colours and clothing and beyond. And then you see the bruised banana kit from 1992 just kind of amongst all the other kind of colours as well. So the fact that that kind of clothing can simply blend in, not simply as a kind of Arsenal football kit, but as a kind of black diasporic uniform, as akin to anything else one would kind of wear at the carnival. That was why I was kind of looking back and thinking, oh, okay, this makes a lot of sense. But when you think now, more recently, to Arsenal's uh, Jamaica third kit that came out a couple of years ago, that kind of paid homage to the Caribbean connection there. I can help not make connections between that and those periods in the early 90s. Because the clothing becomes important in that way, but also in the ways in which I think 
most clubs now, but Arsenal in particular, are trying to augment um, their kits to a new emerging football fan who isn't going to be bounded to their clubs through allegiances of geography. I, I live quite close to QPR, so therefore I'll become a QPR fan or beyond. It'd be more based on who has the best social media content and the best new kids coming out once a year, which is like thinking about fans as a floating voter, you know, and they're there to kind of be kind of persuaded by these new clubs. So I think That's all kind of new clubs. Back. Being, yeah. In a way, and Tim, as you've often said, from what Professor Clive is saying there, that's a reversion of how people went to um, experience football matches once upon a time. It wasn't always you went to this ground every single week because you only supported this team. You went to the opposition ground, you know, the rival ground, if you like, on alternate weeks because there was football there as well. And that was also a spectacle and entertainment. It feels yeah, like they've but, come round. It's come but that's in, that's in a world where everything is more local. And what, what Professor Clive is talking about is a world that isn't local at all. It's much more mm. uh, uh, a connection. Global. Yeah, mm. some kind of, of, of connection in which history can be rediscovered, reinterpreted and repackaged. I mean, for example, you mentioned Tottenham. They could now do some kind of marketing or some kind of shirt or some kind of thing with Walter Tull bring him Absolutely. to the foreground and make Absolutely. that part of a tradition that it never was part of because they didn't care about it. They didn't know it for a long, long time. Um, in, in, in the case of the, uh, the Arsenal black relationship, do you think from the point of the club, this has always been sincere? Is there anything cynical about this, this, this process of merchandising? Um, how do you feel about it? Um, so I'm quite critical as objective academic as I need to be of the more kind of broader shift towards the commercializing of allegiances in football, be it any club. And, you know, I think one of the things that has changed from my nascent years as a football fan is, do you remember when like you would buy a kit for your kind of Christmas or kind of birthdays? And that was the thing you had. For they didn't, years. when we were kids, they, you, you didn't have them. Honestly. Wow. You, you didn't have them, you know. People didn't used to wear the shirts. You didn't wear the shirts. Well, so I'm a nineties kid, so we yeah, we not, would have them. Not to football grounds, I was going to say, because I do remember my elder brother, who was like a Cockney red, having a Manchester United uh, thing that I borrowed at my school for my school's mm -hmm. sports, you know, football days and everything to make me look good. Uh, so you did have the shirt, but yeah, the, no, nobody wore them. They weren't really, they weren't really marketed. I mean, I was watching just the other day. There was footage of of uh, people coming out of White Hart Lane in the early seventies, and it's the yeah, thing that one. all the people have picked up in the comments. No one's wearing a shirt, you know. Not they all one. look like Alfie Con, yeah. you know, the long hair and so on, you know. But no, Some no people, one's yeah. wearing a shirt. Have scarves. They had scarves and they had yes. bubble hats. Some That's people, yeah. and then we Wear had our little rattlers. Wear your colours. Yeah. But not the shirt. Yeah. But that's, that, that's so, a new thing. That, that's part of your childhood memory that me and him were too old to share, Clive. Yes, yeah, so I'm a 90s kid. So my first kit was um, the Liverpool candy kit with the flakes on from yeah. like 1990. I that, now, yeah. I had to rinse that out for two years because number one, my parents not buying me another one because it's so expensive back then, <laughs> even then. Yeah. So we were able to kind of form cultural memories from having this thing for two years. Yeah. Um, same as, you know, the Arsenal Bruce Banana kit from 1991 or the kit from 1990-1992, which I associate with the Notting Hill Carnival. You can link it to kind of cultural phenomena and memories, whereas now you get three kits every single nine months. And it's harder to kind of make those connections because they're so kind of transient. So I'm critical of the ways in which football now is so kind of reliant on kind of merchandise. It becomes harder and harder now for the things that matter to me and a population maybe 20 years ago to replicate now. So you have these amazing videos that are made by Nike and Adidas launching new kits, and there's three or four of them every single summertime. It's hard to keep up, you know, but also by May the following year, they're redundant in many ways because there's new kits coming out now as well. Yeah. So that is something so to answer your question, I think directly, I think that the whole Black Arsenal concept is something that Arsenal now recognise 
but it's also really always been about how black communities themselves think about Arsenal as opposed to what Arsenal can do for black communities. And I think there is meeting points now where they are really kind of trying to augment that history and make it their own and make it valuable and open up to kind of broader apertures of people, which is fantastic. But primarily, you know, how do black people in London and beyond feel about Arsenal as a broader club culture, which doesn't mean just match days, but also means what you consume, how it's referenced, in the point of kind of affinity and connection. And that's what really kind of matters here. This, this is what really cheesed me off with Arsenal Fan TV. I know the guy that started it, Robbie, Robbie Earnshaw. He was once a reggae MC called Crucial Robbie. Mm. And his famous track was, Proud to be black, Muhammad Ali, make me proud to be black. Proud to be black, I'm proud to. And it was amazing. He was a great MC. And I, and I love the guy to bits. And what he's come up with is genius. But I can understand why it was a black guy that started Arsenal Fan TV. I could never understand if it was, the same was true of Tottenham. I think, what? You know, it would be a bit weird because I think it's changed now. I shouldn't be so critical about Tottenham. I think it's changed now. I think some people are coming out of the colours. But if I was a youngster today, if I was a young black Brit today, um, in the way that we've described what uh, seeing a black footballer meant to young people growing up in the 70s, 80s, 90s and stuff, I'd support Crystal Palace because that's where most of the black footballers are. Sometimes Crystal Palace are like a black team and that sometimes includes a goalkeeper um, or there'll be one white person. And I'm not making a racist point about this, but it is hard for me, watching Crystal Palace as a footballer, not wanting them to win because they're kind of like representing me in a way that they may not be um, cognizant of, but nevertheless they are. I'm like, wow, wow. Is, for, for both of you, is the force of that representation as strong as it was when there were so few black players? I mean, for Clive, the relationship that you have today with, say, Saka, is that as intense and as pure as a relationship that you once had with John Barnes? Wow. Amazing question. I think it's different. <laughs> it's different because I think, obviously, as a British Nigerian, I recognise and identify a lot of traits in Saka that I like to think are quite germane to being a British Nigerian. But I think also it's a different time. So I remember this summer, obviously, when England got to the final. And there was a lot of talk in the media, quite cynical talk and quite celebratory talk about, come on, England, if England win, is going to kind of make its new national identity of inclusion and beyond, which I thought was a lot of kind of crap, basically. And the reason being is not that football culture as a national culture doesn't influence the way we think about ourselves and others at junctures. It was more, I didn't believe at this particular moment in time that being black and being British was being so contested in a way that England winning becomes material, as maybe people are suggesting. Now, if you want to make that argument, you go back to the early 90s. You know, for instance, England under um, Graham Taylor weren't qualifying, we're getting beat, and we're playing a lot of black players in the team at the time. You know, Carlton Palmer, Des Walker, John Salako, John Barnes, Ian Wright, that's Ferdinand, Paul Ince, uh, Paul Parker and onwards, and not doing particularly very, very well. At a time when Combat 18 was still, you know, present at Wembley Stadium, where black players were still getting bullets through the post, and where being black and British was still a contested term that was being contested through things such as music with Soul to Soul, or Maxi Priest, or the Real McCoy in the BBC, you know, or Linford Christie in the Olympics. That's when that breakthrough is really kind of taking place where it mattered and where England doing well would have a material impact on how we think about ourselves and others as a unified national identity. So that's the point where it mattered. And it's the point where I think for me, it was more significant on a human level, finding that connection to kind of maybe a John Barnes or an Ian Wright or anyone. It could have even been a Rude Hollett playing for kind of Holland. I would still have made that connection because I recognise that being black and British at a particular time was being heavily contested in a way that I think and hope isn't being so contested now with a sacker in 2024. 
I, th I think there is such a difference between being a black player for the England team, the national team, whichever nations it is, and being a black footballer for your club. I think there's a completely different experience. I must say, I'm less cynical of the England inclusiveness of black players now. Um, ever since the uh, Euros... Uh, you know, uh, four years ago, when, uh, as we know, the three of the black players missed penalties and there was this whole sort of attack on them. In John Barnes's day, he had to deal with all that on his own. <laughs> you know, there wasn't anybody from the FA putting their arm around him and saying, never mind. It was more the other way around. You know, it was more, come on, they're framed banana skins, be a man, you know, get on with it. There wasn't that much sympathy for him. So, I mean, somebody someday will do a proper kind of biopic on John Barnes and it will be all revealing because I think that affected him throughout. I think he, it's still baggage that he carries with him. I remember Stan Kroenke, uh, sorry, not Stan Kroenke, Josh Kroenke, because, um, you know, the uh, the Amazon film, um, the Emirates oh, film, mm. what's it called again? All or Nothing, I think. Yeah, it was All or Nothing. Yeah, it was the All or Nothing series, but the one on Arsenal. Um, and they're filming uh, Bukayo Saka in training, and he gets a call from, you know, Josh Kroenke, who's probably in New York. And you can only hear Josh Kroenke's voice, but he's basically saying, man, you know, don't worry about them lot. Yeah, the lot that have been abusing you, you know, they're not even worth it, you know, and you're what matters to us. You, who you are, is what matters to us. You're going to show them and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, wow, that's different from what I remember, how things used to be. And um, But the club experience, there is a relationship with the club fans that you don't necessarily have, or that you don't have with the national team fans. Even when England trot out, and it was the first time I noticed it, and I think I've told you before, Tim, the first time I noticed that half of the England team were black was in that uh, World Cup in, uh, was it in Korea and uh, Japan? So, 2002, it was, uh, 2002. Ashley, Ashley Cole. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. And the England played Brazil in, in an early morning yeah. match. Yeah, I remember you saying, it's yeah. the moment yeah. when, when like, your wife, your wife makes the point exactly. to you that you shouldn't be supporting Brazil anymore. You should be supporting your people who, who are with England. It's it, just well, on this, this notion of support structure. I'm a long, long way away. So this is a question rather than a statement. But it, it just seems to me, I wonder if you agree, that these days the white players get it. And the, the way that the white players were taking oh, the knee together, God, it's big, big, because, I mean, the white players now, they've come up through the youth ranks. They are, it seems to me, again, it's a question more than a statement. They're much more clued in to the black experience and what that means than they were before. And Pat Nevin has told us, you know, when Pat Nevin took his stand against racism, that he wasn't really supported by many in the Chelsea dressing room, you know. And it, it, my impression is that at least that as that as massive progress has been made now because the white players have much more awareness of the black experience. Is that fair? Yeah, I think so. I think one of the reasons why is I think in the present day, and you mentioned about kind of sack and beyond, is you know the young British player, white British player, would have grown up predominantly in London, in a much more multicultural environment where those things become a bit more gang to them. I think this is the point where culture and cultural product become quite important, be it music or fashion or, you know, visual arts or beyond, that allows for connections between people living in working class environments in kind of London. You know, my environment is very, very kind of um, multicultural as well. There are a lot of, kind of working class Irish people that I grew up with. So the, the point I'm making with this is that it's absolutely conceivable as to why people would take the knee in 2000, 2000, um, sorry, 2021, 20 and beyond, because they'd grown up in organic multiracial experience yeah. that was replicated in their academies. 
I think there's one study that kind of said, I think that like most academies in at least London are, I think, 60% black. I mean, I spent a lot of time at Hale End and they've got a huge amount of black players from under 11s upwards. And they do a lot of work around inclusivity and diversity in a much more natural way. Yeah. By, you know, doing excursions together and visiting the black cultural archive. So I think most youth team players coming from kind of clubs in London who get to the first team will understand instinctively um, about ideas of kind of solidarity and um, allegiances and doing the right thing in regards to kind of racism and maybe 20 or 30 years ago. Do you know, um, Andy, 100%, um, you're right, Professor Clive, a couple of incidents to me tell me it's not just football, but it's just society has changed. I remember once driving into Media City, um, my place of work at Five Live, and I was listening to uh, one of the football phone-ins or whatever on Five Live as I was driving in. And there was that guy that used to be captain of Bolton Wanderers, Kevin Davis. And for some reason, they were talking about racism. And he's a white guy. And they were talking about racism in uh, football for whatever reason. And uh, Kevin Davis said, well, of course, I've never experienced it, but my brother has turns out that he's got a brother of mixed heritage and his brothers told him about it. So even in society today, you're going to find it hard push. I think it's rather like Brazil, you know. Cole, like Cole Palmer. Cole Palmer, you know, what, what, what an example. Yeah. Brazil, is more, Brazil is more complicated because of the legacy of enslavement. But you would agree, wouldn't you, that, and I know that they did that survey, which surprisingly showed that however many percentage of the DNA in Brazilians was more European than they expected than African. But you would agree, would you not, that in Brazil, um, you'd be a fool to suggest that you were purely of European extraction because... Yeah, a lot of people... I mean, my, my, my grandson, who's really my step-grandson, his I've real granddad, yeah, his real granddad, who's no longer with us, is black. Uh, and the family is Italian. So the father, my, my son-in-law, he's Italian, looks Italian with a black dad. So you want to know about racism, you ask him. Because he has heard it all. He's heard it all, you know, from people who've got no idea that his dad's black. Uh, so it, it, it's the, the legacy of, of, because the end of enslavement in Brazil didn't improve the position of, of the enslaved very much. They would just forget, well, forget them, forget them, and let's import a white Euro, uh, a European working class. Uh, and I don't, I don't know how that one's going to be solved. I really don't. There's been, there's been lots and lots of progress, yes. But anyway, in these, these days, it's so difficult to incorporate any mass working class in a modern economy. It's the way that, that technology has gone. So the Brazilian poor, so many of whom are, are black and have never had the opportunity to, to, to accumulate capital to get in the game. And without a welfare state, you need capital to get in the game. How are you going to pay for education and so on? Uh, and, and so this, this, this is, a, is, is a real concern. It's a concern in our country. Uh, as, you know, imagine in Brazil with, with the, legacy, the legacy of enslavement. Yeah, this has been a fascinating conversation, and this is only the preamble to what we're here to talk about. Honestly, it's it's so fascinating. Yeah, but, but it's, it's George it's Graham's really Arsenal. There's there's no football there, is there? I'm, Clive, <laughs> Clive. I mean, our send. I'll give you our send. And our send. You know, he's a, he's he's a, you know. I know. I know he didn't see anything. I didn't see it. I didn't. I know. But what what he did was because he he's changed the club. He's changed. <laughs> And he's he's a, he's, uh, yeah. he's it's a it's a rebranding of the club. But blimey, Clive, George Gray, it was it was soul destroying football. How did how did you? I, I know you've got Rocky Rowcastle and so yeah. on, but how did you identify with this this soul destroying, life draining experience that was George Graham's Arsenal? I mean, luckily, uh, my mitigating factor is I was a bit too young to understand the tactical machinations of um, late 80s, early 90s, first division football, and focused more on the person scoring the goal in the other end, which is Ian Wright, which is perfect for me. Okay, that's what football is. Um, 
But um, yeah, I mean, I picked that game um, because I thought that 1993 was quite an important moment in the whole Black Arsenal concept for me as a human being, uh, but also just about the whole book in itself as well, because the chapter in the book that really kind of deals with this is called Defining Black Arsenal. And the opening image is uh, Michael Thomas's goal against uh, Liverpool in 89 at Anfield and ends with um, Ian Wright's uh, goal against Sheffield Wednesday in the replay in 1993. Now, in between those four years, and as you both know more than I do, there was a massive transition in football, uh, you know, the one being obviously the Premier League emergence in 1992. Now, I'm... I just remember, little by little, the transition from the old first division to Premier League, more in terms of actual content. So when I was very, very young, I remember you'd have like one game on ITV on a Sunday afternoon, which may be Derby County versus Norwich City. It random. wasn't always the kind of Very random. Club. It, it, was, yeah. it was much more than we got when we were kids. They no, don't know they're got, born. We, they don't know they're yeah, born. It's not, do that they? is true. But we did get. So we we got, did. We were young enough to get the big match as well, you know, on a Sunday. Yeah, yeah. But not well, just big match the TV. And then, if you're lucky, you get like um, FA Cup on the BBC, which again will be very, very random. It will be like um, Liverpool versus, you know, like um, Barnet or something, you know, in the third round. And then, if you're lucky, the bigger teams come up in the semi final and the kind of final as well. So you're kind of starved of a football live TV. And then all of a sudden, I remember thinking, well, there's a sky dish now we have in our house and I'm getting like three games a week now. This is amazing. And I remember the first day of the Premier League season on match a day, watching Shearer's debut goals um, for Blackburn against Palace and uh, watching Liverpool get beat by Forest on the kind of Sunday. Uh, Arsenal got beat by Norwich, I think 4-2 uh, that um, afternoon as well. So it was quite an important transition kind of period in going from what they realised in 89 was if you could reconstruct football and fixtures, obviously because the Hill disaster they kind of played on the Friday, but even still the premise was if you situate particular live games, you could then augment a particular audience, which could be kind of packaged as a kind of global experience. And that was basically the Premier League and Sky Sports. So I begin by thinking about 1993 and looking back at the transition to more live TV and how that created iconic moments, but also icons. You know, I remember the opening weekend watching the Ian Wright Can I Kick It advert on TV with Nike. And that was immense because before then, you'd watch John Barnes, you know, doing a Lucas advert, which may have been okay in like 1992, but wasn't so great in comparison to Ian Wright doing Nike. And I guess with black people, well, you make these associations between kind of popular culture and Nike going back to the Michael Jordan days, not so much Lucas Ed. So I argue that there's a transition in 1992 from John Bynes being the kind of poster boy for English football, obviously Gaz was in Italy now, to Ian Wright. Also because, bear in mind, um, John Bynes got injured against Finland before the Euro in 1992, and he wasn't really featured heavily in that opening few months of the Premier League. So Ian Wright, by chance, ascends upon this kind of focal point, I think. So we end really with the kind of um, those two finals because I, again, grew up in Northwest London, and our estate backed up onto the um, Wembley Stadium. And you would get uh, team buses. That Chalk Hill? Chalk Hill? No, it's St. Raph's. So St. Okay. Raph's estate opposite sure. the Park Estate. And literally coaches would come up the kind of North Circular and do a shortcut through the estate to get round to Wembley Stadium and get stuck, basically, because it's such a kind of narrow road. Mm -hmm. We would see, like, the Milan teams, I think, in 1992. We saw England teams all the time pass through us. And the morning of the... Uh, first game against Wednesday, the Arsenal bus came through our estate um, en route to Wembley. And we saw, you know, Tony Adams and, you know, Paul Merson and Ray Parler and Ian Wright and Kevin Campbell all on the bus. Um, it's one of those, so you mentioned earlier on our conversation about nostalgia for the days when the FA Cup meant something. It was an extravaganza. And that morning was, you know, I think probably one of the last ones I remember where I watched the whole coverage from 12 o'clock on Grandstand till like, I think, 5 p.m. Exactly. And like, it's so exactly. weird to explain to like 
kids now that yeah, yeah. you get interviews with like, you know, players in their hotel rooms kind of hanging out or like having a massage or, you know, in a pool somewhere. And the access was amazing that you wouldn't get now because they're so kind of guarded football players. And there's a segment in the guard in the um the um grandstand episode where Ian Wright and Kevin Campbell are getting their haircuts in their um hotel room and they brought in a barber to put their fades and their designs and yeah, yeah. I remember watching that thinking well that's what I see all the time you know when I'm in the barber shop on the estate seeing black men yeah. getting their haircuts in the barbers and yeah. talking about football in the arsenal yeah and yeah. that was how I made these kind of connections so I just thought if any game to really kind of make those linkages on a footballing and recognition term it would be you know that game and that coverage from the grandstand as well mm. I tell you, watching footballers in those days or following football in those days was like watching the dedicated fashions of, you know, the pop stars. For us, again, the last time I saw, uh, the only time I ever met David Rowcastle, Rocky Rowcastle, he was coming out of a lift at the exhibition centre in Islington, Islington Business Centre or whatever it's called. And it was for uh, an event that was called Afro Hair and Beauty. He came out of the lift mm. with, with Ian Wright, with Ian Wright to the Afro Hair and Beauty show, if you can imagine that. I was like... I mean, I had to make out like I was a gooner. I, didn't, I don't think I made out that I was a gooner, actually. I think Ian Wright I'd met before, and he knew that I was, you know, a rogue black man, as it were. But, you know, with Roe Castle, I was fawning all over him and everything, saying, legend, wow. legend, <laughs> and whatnot. And, you know, they were wearing the clothes that we were wearing, like you say, or upmarket version of what we were wearing. But I just remember either Ian Wright or... Row Castle in a sort of a leather length trench coat, which must have been the style because I've seen Kevin Campbell do this as well. We do have to talk about this match, though. <laughs> our, our, our guest, who has uh, been responsible for uh, distracting us off the... Uh, the first leg was 1-1 and Arsenal won the second leg 2-1. <laughs> Why did you have to go away? Can we move on? <laughs> Yeah, why did you have to give that away? We always build up to the fun. To end <laughs> of. Well, we're talking to Professor Clive Shijoke Nwonka, who's the Associate Professor of Film, Culture and Society at University College London. He's also the editor of this new book we've been talking about, Black Arsenal. So the match that we've been talking about goes to the FA Cup final in 1993. Uh, it's Arsenal versus Sheffield Wednesday, and it's a one all draw as Tim has given away in the first leg but let's talk about the second leg at the very very least which was three or four days later so the initial match took place on the 15th of May 1993 and I think the uh, subsequent match took place is it on the 20th of May I think it was a think Thursday so, yeah. after yeah, anyway. yeah. yeah. Uh, a Thursday, Thursday afterwards yeah, um, yeah. Ian Wright <laughs> scored in that game, and he there's scored an, with a there's header. There's an obvious question here. Believe. Yeah, Wright scored in the first game with a header, and he scores yeah. in the second game with a. T- right. It's a, it's a lovely finish. He just makes it look easy. You know, Alan yeah. Smith puts him one on one with a goalkeeper. He's so often you see the goalkeeper block those one on one, but he's just got the presence of mind just to wait for Chris Woods to commit himself and then dink it over. And there's an obvious question here about Ian Wright because I, I used to see a lot of Ian Wright. I've got a, a big mate who's a Palace fan. And uh, when he was at Palace, not much of a name. My mate said, look, you've got to come and down and have a look at this. And it was right and bright at Palace in the old second division. And here they are on opposite sides. Oh, so I've yeah. seen a, <laughs> watched a lot of, of, of Ian Wright. And the question that's always left with him is, why wasn't he, he why didn't he do it with England? And is that an emotional thing? And the, one of the big reasons that we didn't qualify for USA 94 one of the first matches in that qualifying series, early in, uh, um, back end of 92, we're at home to Norway. And we massacre Norway. They get a 1-1 draw with a, with, a, with a 40-yard goal from nothing. But we massacred them and couldn't put them away. And Ian Wright missed so many chances. Was it? Mm. I mean, you, you were talking earlier on, Dotton, about the difference for a black player playing for England. Was it extra nerves at that level that, that stopped him establishing himself as, as, as an England great as well as a Palace and an Arsenal great? Hmm. I'm not quite sure it was the level 
because again, you both know more than I do that that England team was in a lot of transition at the time. The Italian ninety kind of team had kind of broken up by um, yeah. um, Graham Temp- maybe before their time, maybe a couple more years left in them. And the players who emerged will all become Premier League greats in three, four years' time. A Shearer, a Tony Adams, mm-hmm. uh, beyond as well. But at that kind of time, they're very, very young. Injuries, I think, helped as well or didn't help. Sorry, uh, Gaza, Stuart Pearce, others as well. So the guys who were playing were all amazing players, and Ian Wright was one as well. So I'm not quite sure it was the level. I think it was just more the fact that they're a very, very nascent squad and wouldn't come to prominence until maybe I, I really... Yeah, when Ven- Venables had the chance with him, you know, in those two years. Mm. And there, there was one moment when he played, uh, and he, I think he missed a chance. And the camera panned to Venables, and you could see him saying his touch isn't good enough. Yeah. But it never looked that, way. It never looked of, that way for Arsenal, did it? I think there are a lot of players. I mean, even Andy Cole was someone who suffered from that, yeah. you know, maybe having like one or two chances to kind of impress yourself. And if not, there were so many other strikers at yeah. the time. So you have one chance. So there was obviously Shearer and a Sharon Yeah. There was a Robbie Fowler who couldn't even get um, um, a look in. There was, you know, a Ferdinand. There was, you know, a Letizia. Chris Sutton, you know, like yeah, you're right. a huge amount of strikes at the time. So maybe there was a lot of kind of pressure on Ian Wright to make an impact in the games think, they can have had. I think Ian Wright was uh, the proudest of the black players I can think of in playing for England, just in terms of sheer pride. There is one thing that I will remark on, despite the fact that Tim will not give George Graham any shrift whatsoever. No, he, he, he was obviously very successful. Game. Can't knock but it. He but also, it was, he also put watch. his arm around Ian Wright. He put his arm around Ian Wright, you know. I remember right. Ian Wright getting up for some FA disciplinary thing. I remember it because he had one of those sort of like, you know, hats from the old days, the old Sting Baker's Boys hats mm-hmm. kind of thing. I remember that was the style he was rocking for that one. And yeah. right next to him was George Graham. He didn't have to go. Didn't have to go with him. He uh-huh. was looking after his, you know, prized possession, if you like. Um, and I think, you know, the, the comment that you've just made saying he hasn't got the touch. Well, hang on a second. Like you say, he has got the touch because he does it for Arsenal. Yeah. So the question the manager or the coach should be asking is, have we got the touch that he needs? You know, um, mm-hmm. uh, whether, you know, from a sort of a personal point of view or tactical point of view. Um, and and like Professor Clive says, there are other players as well who didn't do it for England. Um, and, you know, Andy Cole, you cannot argue... I mean, it's difficult to argue that he wasn't the best centre-forward in England at the time. It's difficult to answer. When you saw him play for Manchester United, even for Newcastle, arguably, but certainly when he started playing for Manchester United... And he, he, st- and he started at Arsenal. Yeah, they all do. They all do. Um, so, yeah, uh, Arsenal have got a lot to be... Uh, we've got a lot to be thankful to Arsenal for uh, through gritted teeth, obviously. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, when you looked at Andy Cole, particularly once Dwight York came in to be the second striker for Manchester United and they had that sort of relationship going on, uh, Andy Cole just had the moves. He could turn on a sixpence and bang it in, you know. Um, so England's got to ask itself those questions. Mm-hmm. I think. So the outcome of this was yet, yeah, Tim, we're coming to the conclusion now. The outcome it's, of this... It's going to penalties. Arsenal, it's going to be, it's going to be Arsenal, penalties, Arsenal, isn't it? It's Arsenal. going to be penalties. And then, <laughs> and then I've, I've often said, Dot- Dotton will back me up on this. I've often said Go that on. goals from corners shouldn't count. Yeah, uh, I know you have. If, you have. <laughs> if, if goals from corners don't count, it's 1-1 one, one draw. But the unlikely <laughs> hero, I've forgotten he played there. Andy Linegan, a big centre-back they bought from Norwich. I don't good. know where Steve Steve Bulb was injured or something. And it's Andy Linegan who's, who's who's the unlikely hero. I still yeah. think the goalkeeper should have saved it, Chris Woods. I think he should have stood up stronger. Well, he yeah, and then also, um, I think it was Graham Hyde tried to clear it off the line and kind of boot it into the roof of the net, which didn't help as well. No, so sure. also he will take a share of the blame as well. But I think the, a quick kind of um, preface. So the reason why the game is also important to me as someone who wasn't an Arsenal fan, but was around Arsenal supporters in school and in my local area. And had seen and heard people talk about the game of anticipation the whole week beforehand. 
Because I live quite close to Wembley, I remember both watching and hearing at the same time, which is a weird experience when you're watching something on TV and you can hear the crowds yeah. from your back window. Arsenal against Spurs in 1991 uh, in FA Cup semi-final. And um, obviously, um, Arsenal lost that. And I remember it importantly because I went to the Arsenal parade when they won the league title in 91 because I had some cousins on Avenue Road who are Arsenal fans and it so happened on the day the prayer was there. I saw the bus go past and everyone was talking about them having should have won the double. They won the league at a canter, lost one game all season to kind of Chelsea and um, they should have won the semi-final. I think they would have beaten Forest in the final as well. But they didn't and obviously kind of um, Spurs went on. So two years later, they meet no, Spurs they again. won't be getting a double up the Arsenal. <laughs> I was I was in was Brazil for the first time. I was in Brazil for a few weeks. My first little recce mission during that ninety three semi final, and this is ninety three. Wow, this, this is a world without internet or anything like that. It took me days to find out the result. Oh wow! That wow. We played the arse off the park and lost one nil to some horrible set piece Tony Adams header. Yeah. <laughs> so there was an important picture in that semi final that I remember on the grandstand coverage of uh, the late Kevin Campbell and Ian Wright just embracing um, on the pitch. And it meant so much to them to get to the final this time. And that really connects to the replay. And, you know, again, like replays still had a quite important feel to people. I remember, you know, um, in 1990, uh, Palace versus um, United going to replay. And, you know, just a a nighttime game meant something when it Wembley, particularly when it was a final. And of course, Palace lost that one. Um, so this one felt like a similar feel to me, like an even game on a Thursday night, um, Wednesday versus Arsenal. And after Ian Wright scores that first goal, um, he runs to the corner and he's again embraced by the late Kevin Campbell. And that meant something to me at the time, because if you both remember, only a couple of weeks before that final, um, Stephen Lawrence had been killed in Elton. Uh and in my mind all i saw for the following two weeks was either the image of ian wright talking about the game or the image of stevie lawrence on a news report and that was lodged in my mind in the kind of newspapers in all the days coming to the final so i couldn't help feel that making the connection between seeing two black men on the pitch at wembley embracing um alongside you know the image of kind of stevie lawrence that has been circulated in um, the, the press in the weeks and days um, leading up to it as well. So there, there's something very, very emotive for me about that particular goal, but of course the fact that Arsenal won uh, with the Lindigan goal in the last minute. So yeah, a very, very poignant game from that perspective, but also mm-hmm. one, I think, in quite important in the context of the new Premier League season coming to a final close by this kind of game, television and the spectacle of, you know, last minute goals and things, which is precisely what the Premier League was there to actually try and instill was the idea that football could be packaged in a way that makes it meaningful in these amazing moments to kind of people. And that certainly was one for me as well. So Arsenal won the 1993 FA Cup final. Did you get that, Tim? Are you taking notes? Good. Yeah, congr- because... congratulations to them. Yeah. Well, that's See, I can, I can, I can be big about it. Yeah, I know. Very magnanimous of After you. all this time. Yes. <laughs> um, but what you've been telling us, Professor Clive, has been an amazing sort of, uh, I suppose, potpourri of anecdotes, mm-hmm. um, fragments of the story of black British football. Uh, and perhaps there'll be a much more fulsome and um, linear narrative that will make the kind of sense to football fans that maybe something like Fever Pitch has made. Certainly, Mm. I think there is, you know, you may have already done it. I haven't read the book, I confess, but I look forward to it. I've got a copy now. But um, maybe that's a way, if you haven't done it, of um, telling the sort of personal narrative that you've shared with us so much today, Mm. because I think that's really how you get into... uh, the whole experience and of course part of that experience is the soundtrack to it and we always look at the soundtrack um, there's there's one that i'm desperate to ask you about from from uh, this soundtrack okay um go on go on 
Well, it's, no, uh, I tell people who haven't heard the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast before that we always look at the iconic game, which is uh, the FA Cup final 1993, but we also try and bring in the musical soundtrack to give people a much more maybe rounded experience of the times and so on. But go on then, Tim. Um, and I hope you, well, well, I know you know your music, Professor Clive, so we'll get there in a moment. Especially, certainly in a kind of pre-John Barnes era, I know from reading Gary Young and from talking to to, to, to you, Dot, and 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 talking to other black friends, that obviously because of a lack of cricket critical mass in the UK, you're so often looking to the states for your heroes. And you talked about Muhammad Ali, the song there with 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 with, with Muhammad Ali makes me proud to be black. And so a lot of the British black experience has been looking to the United States. And there's, there's, a, there's a song here that it's Moni Love, Born to Breed. Because yep. this is, this is, a, this is a, Lond- a black London girl. South London, yeah. Brixton and even. Oh, Clapham, Clapham, forgive me. Oh, she's gone to the States late 80s. So she hasn't mm. been there very long. Uh, and she's coming out. I, I, I enjoyed her stuff very much at this time. And this one, born to breed, about the experience of a single mother and so on, is 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 intelligent. It's good. But what what do you feel about the fact that well, she's been in the states like three or four years, and she's doing this in such an American accent and talking about yep. the American experience? Yep. What do you feel about that? Well, do you, do you want to go for this, Professor Clive, or do you want me to jump in? You please jump in. Okay, I, I knew Moni Love quite well. Simone Johnson, I seem to remember her surname being. Uh, she came up about 1990 uh, with a South London crew that included some other rappers. Um, oh, gosh, I can't remember what the other main rapper's name was now off the top of my mind. And he was kind of more successful here in the UK. But she was always on a trajectory that she was going to go to the States. And it was a kind of similar trajectory to Goldie, by the way, because he knew from an early age he needed to go to the States to pursue his graffiti. She knew that she needed to go to the States to pursue her hip-hop. Initially, in uh, New York. She came out with a tune, her first tune was a tune called Moni in the Middle. By the way, she'd always had this American accent thing going on in the UK, which I think held her back here in the UK. But there's nothing quite like going to the States and earning your stripes, particularly at this time of UK rappers, because none of them had broken through in the States whatsoever. And she didn't so much as break through, but she came out with a song called Moni in the Middle, which became a little kind of a uh, pop hit in the United States. But then she went deeper and deeper, and she never came home. Whereas yeah. some of the other rappers went over to the States and came back. She never came home. The last time I saw her here in the UK was at a Breaking Convention, which is this amazing spectacle that, um, you know, former break dancer uh, John Z. D. puts on at Sadler's Wells, and he had used her as a co-host then. And it was funny to hear her trying to sort of reclaim some of her South London accent. That's what she's got to do now because she's been in America so long. She's been a radio presenter of late in the States, etc. But her her... Because she was caught, it says Moni in the middle. She's right. She's in the middle of the Atlantic. She's in the mid-Atlantic between English and American. I would say she's more American now because she's been there. I mean, she pr- pretty much left but, the UK. Uh, yeah, my, my point is, even back then, the most of her life. Yeah. she's coming across. And if you didn't know, you would think that this is this is 100% American about the American experience. It's all talk about yes, pistols, yes, packing pistols yes, and, 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 yes, and so on. Yes. Would you rather, would it be better and more authentic for her to, to have done it in her own accent about her own experience? Well, would you say to a, um, would you say to Shakespeare, and let's face it, rappers are the poets of our generation. Would you say to Shakespeare, You'd have been better doing that in a Midlands accent in your own well, we accent. We don't know what accent he did. You know, there's no recordings. Well, is there? I think we're pretty sure that he had a Midlands accent. He might have changed it a bit when he came to London to do the uh, Globe Theatre, but he would have been. He would have spoken more like this. Um, and I just can't see to be or not to be. 
That is a question whether it is nobler in their mind to suffer the things and arrows of outrageous fortune. Do you see what I mean? You do whatever mm. is the landscape that you're faced with and who you are. It actually ties in, would you not say, to a certain extent, Professor Clive, in the conversation we've been having about black football, black British football, as we say, but actually they are British footballers who are black and some of them are more cockney than the most cockney person around. And that is the, um, there's this uh, poem by Paul Lawrence Dunbar, it's an American poet from the beginning of the 20th century called We Wear the Masks. That's what you do sometimes, or you did sometimes when you were black in the white experience. And it's not a million miles from the experience of um, Moni Love, black British woman, who goes to the States and she can't be a black British woman anymore. She's changed. She's changed. And that's really the experience of her change. Born to Breed, which like you say, is a great track. It's at number 18 in the chart. I don't mind. Yeah. You know, sorry, Professor Clive. I mean, I was very, very young, of course, but I remember Moni Love. I think my first experience of her was It's a Shame. Mm. Um, yes, that's true. I think that, it was yeah. Cover, of and course. I just presumed it must be an American woman because of just the the accent of the kind of rapping. But I think also at the time there was so much new music coming out that was black and British, but had these kind of like reference points where you sometimes thought, well, okay, the American influence there. So mm. credits to the nation were important in the same way, you know. Um, the whole like, acid jazz scene, you know, the, the brand new heavies or Young Disciples, for instance. So that whole sound uh, was also interesting. But also there were other things that were more closer to my own experience in my local region that I guess fill the void of any confusion. So, you know, Jazzy B and Soul to Soul, you know, Club Classics was kind of doing the Black British thing in a much more kind of overt ways for me. Maxi Priest, you know, mm. a whole range of kind of different kind of uh, musicians there were really kind of flying the flag. So... For those people who are growing up around the, the Black M radio stations or just in the back locations, you know, that was music being kind of played to you was that. So that for me really kind of um, helped me to kind of grind that whole period of time in a kind of Black Britishness because the music was being produced by people, you know, from London, you know. If it's just about accents, it's very difficult as an artist. I said to my missus the other day, my missus is a musician. I said to my missus the other day, I mean, a couple of years back now, but I said to her, why do you sing with an American accent? He said, no, I don't. I said, well, yes, you do. You don't sing with the accent it, it, of somebody. It's hard It's hard not to. Exactly, exactly. Do you know who said that to me? Glenn Matlock of the Beatles. He came yeah. out of this album, a country... The Sex I remember, Pistols. The Beatles, I the Sex Pistols. Well, they were the Beatles of their generation, arguably. So Glenn and Matlock the of the... Yeah, Ken Matlock of the Sex Pistols bass player. He came out with an album, going back maybe about 10 years now, which was a country western album. And I interviewed him at the time. Remember the the uh, the Pistols, like all the punks, were famous for doing it in our English accents. That was whole You couldn't get away. I mean, Richard Vo uh, Hell and the Voidoids could do it in an American accent, uh, but we had to do it in an English accent. That's what you, made it You had to make, to, to do it in an English accent, You've really got to make a, a, a forced effort to sing in your own yes, accent. So, exactly. With with Look, rapping, it's the opposite. If you're rapping, I think you've got to make a forced in an American accent. No, you've I don't think. Do I, don't, I, I think that. That's, well, in those days, no, you're right. You don't have to. You don't have to until somebody breaks the chain, as it were. Look at uh, the number one. What is soul to soul? And he did it. You know, he didn't do it very well. well hang on a second. Hang fucking on a second. hated him for doing it. Fucking yeah, hate them. There's a record that Moni loves on, you know, doing our own day, yeah. when they're just yeah. moaning about these people like like Jazzy B doing rap. Yeah, wait a second, wait a second. We'll, we'll come back to Jazzy B. We'll come back to Jazzy B. I'm happy to do it. I was looking at the number one track, Oh Carolina, Shaggy. Oh Carolina, ba bam, bam, ba bam. Shaggy is a Jamaican. He's got every right to do Oh Carolina, but at this point. He's been in the American Navy. He's been living over in the States. When you interviewed Shaggy at this point, which is probably about 
83, 82, 83. He comes out of Oak Carolina. I was living in Stockholm at the time. The record company sent me the record, and I knew straight away it was going to be here. It's an old folks brothers tune and they do it exactly the same except they do it without the energy and the american accent because they're hardcore jamaica shag is not actually singing in his real accent at the time because he had this kind of american jamaican thing going on but when you hear it it sounds like he's straight out of the ghettos of kingston it's a very jamaican Um, top 10 isn't it well mr loverman by shabba ranks which has been well, the joke about this is it's now represented, not by Shabba, not by Shabba. And by the way, just this weekend, my missus played a gig, an old sound system gig in Bedford. And there was this woman in like backstage, a few artists backstage, a woman goes up to me and said, don't I know you? And I'm like, yeah, I recognize you as well. And she goes, oh, do you still write for the Voice newspaper? And I was like, whoa, that's going back sometime. That's going back sometime. And it turns out, I remembered her as being this woman. It, it, when it turns out because she was Shabba Ranks' old girlfriend. Uh, That's and, right. Uh, oh, I told you you, you reminded her of her, her of this right in front of her current boyfriend who wasn't impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if I told you that. You remember oh, yeah. the story. Oh, yeah. Let me throw that one out of you. But Bernadine Evaristo, who was a joint winner of the Booker Prize, uh, along with Margaret Atwood just a few uh, years ago, going back, her book before the one that she won the Booker Prize with was a book called Mr. Love a Man um, about a, ga- a Open guy. Open brackets, that was Shabba, gay. close brackets. No, 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 no. Shabba obviously was cancelled um, in the late 1980s, early 1990s when he went on to uh, The Tube, which was a popular, I'm pretty sure it was The Tube, uh, that was a popular Channel 4 music show. And Mark, um, uh, Mark, what was his name? Mark uh, Lamar um, confronted him with his um, homophobia. Anyway, the joke is that Bernadine Everesto has done it as Mr. Love a Man about an undercover gay guy, you know, of Jamaican heritage or whatever it is. So now I can't look at that. In the old days, you say, yeah, I'm Mr. Love a Man, Shabba. But now it's Mr. Love a Man. And I suppose... um, well, obviously, it, that's you're going to have to confront it, your inner homophobia there, aren't you? I, I think. think no, no, no. I've never had any homophobia actually, um, but I have to confront my inner uh, broad-mindedness that mm-hmm. I can still sing it. Yeah, just like you know, when my missus sings a song and says, "You know, I'm so sorry," I sing it as well, even though that's a woman's expression. Anyway, let's leave that to one side. Lenny Kravitz mm-hmm. at number six. Are you going to go my way? Anything that's caught your eye? In this chart, though, Professor Clive? Well, I mean, like, um, I can't see the actual kind of chart, so I can't come up with the things you can kind of see. Can um, I just but... add one more, then, very quickly? And I apologise for cutting you. I've just seen, I forgot, at number eight is Informer yeah, by Snow. it's very Jamaican top ten. And wow. he, no, Snow's a white guy. Yeah, he's Jamaican white, isn't he? You can be no. Jamaican and white. Yeah, you I can. He was Canadian. Is he Canadian? That's right. He's Canadian, uh, you see. But you hear that informer, it sounds like a Jamaican, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, yes. Yeah? You you got sucked into that one, Tim. I did. I think I it's did. Really funny. Well done, Professor Clive. You know your music. That's, anyway, that's you were going to say, learn. forgive me for interrupting you. Yeah. <laughs> forgive me for interrupting you. Go ahead. No, so, um, I mean, there's a lot of music at the kind of period of time, not maybe like kind of particular week at the final. But in the early 90s, that, you know, in many ways in, was in my mind thinking about the book. And I mentioned, obviously, kind of Soul to Soul, um, you know, Maxi Priest, others as well. Um, you know, so there, there's something about the kind of the emergence of Black British music, be it kind of um, soul music or, or rap music or, or beyond, that I think gave an importance to that particular kind of game and the chief protagonist in the game, again, Ian Wright. I mean, I remember Ian Wright doing the bogle on the pitch, yeah, which were, yeah. I think, that was exactly. kind of very, very recognisable to kind of those yeah. within the black music scene in the early 90s, you know, Jungle and and beyond as well. So when I think about music, I think about the connections between, you know, Ian Wright and what he represents on the pitch as someone who would have been embedded 
in the black music scene in London and the things we're hearing on the radio and beyond. There's, there's something you said earlier and it's just tipped off in my mind a little idea because you talked about the brand new heavies and the young disciples and I loved mm. all of that. And it's just after, after this that, that I moved abroad. So you kind of lose connection with it. But just a, 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 perhaps an idea is that then very soon afterwards, the Brit pop thing just went whoosh. And one of the things I never liked about the Brit pop thing, I know that some of the musicians have gone in different directions subsequently, but the Oasis and Blur and so on and Suede and the R&B is cut out. Mm. You know, the Blur were a kind of madness thing without any of the scar. You know, it's like Ian Jury without any of the Chaz Jankel jazz. And Blur, uh, Oasis were a kind of wannabe Beatles, but I think that's without the R&B. And we, we've had people on this who said, yeah, I was really into, into the, the young excitement. Of and then Oasis came in. And I think that maybe that's a shame. Because that, that, that for me, it's, it's the big umbilical cord of, of British music is listening to American and Jamaican music, the vast majority of which is black, and then reinterpreting that and ad adding a British thing, whether you're black or white. And I think maybe the, the Britpop thing is when that umbilical cord weakens. And you still get things afterwards. And Amy, for example, is all about that, you know. But I think that that Britpop thing, and it was so big, and I, I wonder if that's had a detrimental effect on, on, on the culture, weakening the vital umbilical cord of our music. I mean, certainly in that kind of period of time, for three or four years, that course coincided with politics and new labour and the whole core Britannia thing and art and, you know, other kind of cultural exchanges. Whereas, again, to be kind of um, British was a kind of very, very kind of narrow conception, at least culturally, yeah. in terms of visual culture and available culture and mass esteemed culture, which, of course, would have been an Oasis or a Blair or a Suede or, or beyond as well. Now... I think black music historically in the UK has always been a kind of fugitive, subversive, you know, almost outcast cultural experience that began from the sound systems, you know, at the carnival and the underground raves and beyond as well, that would often occasionally kind of creep into the mainstream. So whilst that was going on, you know, what was still developing within the UK was obviously the jungle scene, which remained, uh, but also the opening embers of the garage scene, you know, which became prominent in like 99, 2000, 2001, which also in many ways coincided with a kind of new wave of black celebration, you know, that also was kind of adjoined with, you know, the new Asian call and the celebration of kind of um, British Asians in a way that wasn't done beforehand. So I think these things go in cycles. I think there's always a kind of um, re-emergence of those fugitive minority cultural expressions that are a response to them being eviscerated or pushed out of the kind of mainstream. And we've seen a few examples of that in kind of recent years. So it does go in cycles sometimes. There's always a kind of reaction to the pushing out of um, blackness in the British frame and then coming back into it with other forms of cultural expression as well. You see, I don't agree with team, Tim's uh, evaluation of Britpop there. I will say this though, Tim, in the one way that I do agree with you is Britpop is always a sort of a convenient term for what they often describe as indie music. And indie music is probably the most racist um, musical term there is because just it means blacks are not allowed, you know, or they're only going to be allowed if they do like live in colour and just do a white thing then they might be allowed into that indie pop thing. Because if you think about it, how can you be indie music without including rap? <laughs> rap was the most indie music that ever sure. came about and still yeah. out there and stronger. And uh, like Professor Clive was saying, all the, um, what initially was called Two Step, UK Garage and till today, more known, better known as Grime, Mate, that is indie music. You cannot go. I mean, I love Oasis to bits, but the one phrase, and I think he probably did that and it was helpful in a way, when uh, Jay-Z was going to play at uh, uh, Glastonbury, uh, Noel Gallagher came out and said, no, he doesn't belong at uh, Glastonbury. He needs to get off and go and find his own flipping festivals because, you know, this is like an indie music festival. And doesn't like, that back up everything I said about him? 
Well, no. In terms of leaving out the R and B, no, I don't think it does. Actually, I, I think they've got soul about them, not necessarily. Well, in the you way know, I mean, I, I know a little bit through knowing Steve White, who was well as drummer, and his his brother drummed for him, and he drummed for him for for a while, uh, and he mm. said that he he tried to open Noel's mind to this, you know, and he lent him some Stax records, but Noel had never heard of them. Wasn't yeah, it? Just no. wasn't interested. It's not his thing. White rock. I'm so pleased you mentioned. Um, sorry to interrupt, Steve White. There, um, I'm actually a huge uh, Paul Weller fan, and um, particularly like um, the first two, three solo albums. So Paul Weller debut, um, Wildwood, and, and beyond as well. And I always associate that period with um, Steve White's drumming, which yeah. I'm a massive fan of. I just think like um, there's something about the, the timing of him that was very, very different to the whole Britpop era because he's a jazz drummer, as you know more than exactly. me. Uh, exactly. That yeah. training and that made all the difference. And even in Alan White's drumming in Oasis, you can just hear the sensibilities there a little bit trying to kind of break through mm-hmm. the old Tony McCarroll kind of drumming that made at least them sound a lot more dynamic, maybe than other kind of bands at the time, because Alan White had come for the same tradition kind of jazz drumming as well. So some redemptive elements, I think, to the whole Britpop story do find its way in. Mm-hmm. And then it's Stephen Allen White as well. We have kept Professor Clive long enough, actually. Uh, this has been a long, drawn-out episode of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. For yeah, the reason, never, felt, never felt long and drawn out. It didn't feel like mm. that at all. But I was going to say, the reasons are clear. If you listen to the entire episode, you'll understand why. It's taken us a moment to get to this conclusion. I cannot thank you enough. You need to come back on, is what I would say, Professor Clive, because Mm. I feel like this is only the beginning of the journey. Next time around, of course, uh, both me and Tim with a red, black arsenal from cover to cover to cover, so uh, can talk with... uh, It'll be an even longer podcast, I suspect. Mm. But anyway, for now, thank you very much. Our guest is Clive Gigioke Nwanko, the Associate Professor of Film, Culture and Society at University College, London University. And I think it's fair to say we've done the film. Yeah, we've done the film, The Manageress. We've done the culture. Yeah, of course we've done the culture. And Tick. we've even included some society in that. Yeah, we ticked all the boxes on this one. Clive, thank you very much. Good luck with the book as well. And yeah, keep us updated. When you're ready to come back on, let's do it. I'd love to. Thanks so much for having me. Tim, many thanks.